of Louis Pasteur, we have learned a lot about infectious diseases. We have learned about hygiene, we have learned about vaccines. But in the past century or so, there is one aspect of infectious diseases which we still do not understand much better than when Pasteur was alive. And that is the mechanism of transmission. Particularly when the pathogens are transmitted from breathing, coughing, sneezing, talking, or even singing. When it comes down to airborne disease transmission, there are so many unanswered questions. How does the pathogen of one individual become that of another? Why are some airborne pathogens more easily transmitted than others? You would think we would have this down cold by now, if you were to pardon the pun. After all, we all breathe, cough, sneeze, talk, and some of us even sing. We live with airborne disease transmission every day, but we don't understand it. So here is how I got interested in these questions. I was working in physical mathematics and fluid dynamics, always with an interest in health. I eventually moved to epidemiology as I was uh, interested in having an impact in public health, particularly after the SARS epidemic. As I was working in modeling and data integration, I realized that we really did not understand the mechanism of transmission, leading us to model critical processes as black boxes. The more I thought about transmission, the more I saw connections with fluids. After all, fluids drive transmission. Pathogens are always in fluids, in the body, in water, in the air. What if we could leverage our advances in fluid dynamics and biophysics to elucidate the key mechanisms driving transmission? This seemed like a clearly promising approach, but an unexplored one to the point that we didn't have data to guide our first steps. I decided to focus first on airborne diseases. Imagine that you were tasked to design an airborne disease transmission mechanism. And you were told that the requirements are that it has to enable any of you to be transported and to carry it. That it has to enable travel of the pathogen in different environments, through different distances, different heights. And it has to enable the pathogen to survive outside of the host, potentially for weeks. Well, this is exactly what we are facing. Nature has already designed this mechanism. Do we understand it? And what are the implications of such mechanism? If we are trying to understand this process, a good place to start is to revisit the definition of this term, transmission. And the reason why this is important is because we are not always facing pathogens against which we have vaccines and drugs. In fact, there are so many pathogens against which we do not have vaccines or drugs. And in the best case scenario, even when we understand the pathogen very well, it can take up to 15 or 20 years to deploy a vaccine, and they're not always as effective. Just take flu last year. When facing such a battle, having another card to play can be life-changing. A card that could enable us to block the pathway of transmission. So let's revisit this definition of transmission. In the context of respiratory diseases, the WHO, the World Health Organization, or the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, defines transmission mostly in two routes, the large droplet transmission route and the small droplet transmission route. Assuming that we are exhaling isolated drops, large drops would be those that fall faster than they evaporate. Small drops would be those that evaporate faster than they fall. We would not know where the drops go 
or if a large drop is above 50 or 100 micron and a small drop below that. In other words, this remains descriptive. This remains a black box. Now, this definition of large versus small drop and this picture of isolated drops come from the beginning of the last century, introduced by William Wells in the context of tuberculosis. In particular, he introduced the notion of small drops, which was rejected and ridiculed by the medical community of the time, who did not believe in small and visible things that would remain suspended in the air in part as a pushback on the miasma theory of the Middle Ages, and in part because the legacy of Pasteur in support of the germ theory was not yet common knowledge. Wells persisted, and his legacy today is this static isolated drop picture that we have and dichotomy between large and small drops. Now, most studies are focusing on measuring droplet size distributions from coughing, sneezing, talking, breathing, singing. First, this is a challenge, because we're dealing with bio-aerosols, droplets full of biological material, making the measurements highly variable and inaccurate. This is because the indirect measurement techniques rely on properties calibrated on non-biological material. Second, even if we had high accuracy, the framework would remain stuck in this isolated drop, large versus small dichotomy. I started to wonder, what do we actually learn by measuring a droplet size distribution and stating that the large drop route is for the drops above 50 or 100 micron and the small drop route is the ones below that? What is the action that we can take by knowing this? And it became clear that this isolated drop picture and dichotomy between large and small is non-actionable. There is no information about space and time. The dynamics is missing. The statics may be there, but the dynamics is missing. Yet to control infections, in reality, you need information about space and time. You need dynamics. So I set out to design experiments and develop approaches that could enable us to elucidate what actually happens during human exhalations. This involved collaborations, including with John Bush, Eileen B. Henschelwerker, and it involved different approaches from high-speed imaging, lighting techniques, image extraction, and mechanistic modeling. What you see behind me is what really happens during a human exhalation, sneeze, or cough. What you see behind me is not isolated drops. It's not large versus small drops. It is a cloud, the dynamics of a cloud. Now, with direct measurements, we could quantify the properties of this cloud, the speed, density, volume, evolution with time. With concepts of fluid dynamics, we determined that this cloud is multiphase, with a gaseous phase, the gas phase, the air we exhale, a liquid phase, the droplets within it, and a solid phase, what is left after the drops evaporate, the nuclei or residues. We also determined that this cloud is turbulent. Turbulence is the property of a high energy flow, making the parcels within it swirl around in seemingly disorganized fashion, yet following predictable and deterministic patterns on average. We determined that this cloud is in fact a turbulent puff emitted over a short time scale with respect to the time scale of its overall evolution. And it is emitted from a small source, a point source, the mouth, that is small with respect to the distance over which this cloud evolves and grows as the swirls or eddies at its edge scoop in ambient air. And the more static ambient air is scooped in, the slower this cloud becomes. We also showed that this cloud is buoyant, rising up in most environments, because the air that we exhale is hot and moist, which is lighter than dry and cold air, which is usually the ambient surrounding us. Finally, we showed that this cloud 
traps the drops within it, carrying them forward, not large versus small, but a continuum of droplet sizes. And all these differences and the presence of this cloud, it turns out, are important. On the one hand, you're dealing with an isolated drop picture. On the other hand, you're dealing with the dynamics of a multi-phase turbulent puff cloud. On the one hand, you're dealing with a dichotomy between large and small drops. On the other hand, you're dealing with a continuum of droplet sizes. And all these differences are important, and we quantified and showed how important. Here, the interplay between experiments involving human subjects, the data extraction in great detail and precision, the mechanistic modeling, and a validation with analog precise experiments is critical. When we compared the distance or range reached by the drops with the distances or range that they could reach if trapped in this cloud, the difference was dramatic. First, the cloud enhances the range of all drops. Second, this range can be enhanced by a factor of 200 for the drops that are 30 micron or less, enabling them to swirl and span a whole room in a few seconds. Because the cloud is buoyant and rises up, the drops that are trapped within it can reach ceiling heights, ventilation systems, enabling them to go from room to room if the filtration is not adequate, which is often the case, including in hospitals. And last, the dynamics of this cloud changes the evaporation physics of the drops in it, therefore also affecting the persistence and survival of the pathogens within them. Armed with these insights, it is clear that dynamics and biophysics need to be incorporated in our assessment and modeling of transmission. With these insights and framework and knowledge, we can define transmission based on spatial scales, temporal scales, incorporate the role of the environment and the host physiology under different conditions. Other questions that we can now start addressing is what are the differences between individuals that transmit differently? Not in terms of one droplet size distribution or another, or large versus small, but in terms of the patient's overall ability to disperse them effectively in a range of indoor environments, to disperse them via a multi-phase turbulent puff cloud. And the implications of such dispersal on the persistence in the environment and also on early detection and prevention. We can do all this because we understand the mechanism in terms of dynamics and tractable models. My students and I are working on understanding and trying to elucidate more than just this emission uh, process. This is only the first step of the transmission chain. We're looking at the emission from exhalation, sneeze and cough, but also the dispersal and transfer, the persistence in the environment, the exposure of the new host to these drops, and the biophysics involved, bringing us from large-scale flows to microfluidics. We see a lot of potential in this research in epidemiology from the lens of biophysics and fluid dynamics. With this insight and understanding, we can already start informing better designs of indoor spaces, for example, in hospitals, to limit transmission. We can also optimize our response to high impact pathogens before we have a vaccine or drug ready and continue to limit transmission after we have the vaccine and drug ready. With this understanding, in fact, we can open new pathways for drug and vaccine development that would tackle the angle of transmission. And this knowledge can help us be take better life and death decisions at the front line. For example, what are the risks of exposure for first responders when intervening for a first outbreak from an unknown pathogen? What should they wear? And how is the efficacy of what they wear changing depending on the environment they're in and the patients involved with fluid dynamics and biophysics? 
we can finally bring our understanding of airborne disease transmission. Beyond the era of Louis Pasteur and the isolated drop picture of wells to the 21st century of measurable space and time dynamics. When we truly understand and validate a mechanism, we have the power to predict and control. We can finally innovate in areas that have been neglected so far, thereby fin finding new ways to slow down the spread of infectious diseases, particularly in the most vulnerable population. We may even be able to prevent the next pandemic, and so save lives. Thank you.